Welcome, everyone. So glad you could be here today. And I hope you all have a wonderful Resurrection Day come Sunday. And uh, every day is at Resurrection Day, really, yeah, for, for many of us. Uh, today, we're <clears throat> continuing in the book of James. We're in James 2. 14 through 26, for those who follow along, hopefully hopefully you are doing that. And the title of the lesson is Real or Counterfeit Faith. So we're coming to James' famous discourse, discourse on faith and works, which has always been a, a debate in many circles. James' insistence on doing and deeds or actions is made clear by the 13 times that the words do, deeds, and actions appear in these 13 verses. Faith alone is not enough. It is not good enough to believe only. If faith and believing are not linked to commitment and doing, they're only words without proof and substance. Faith is a key doctrine in the Christian life. The sinner is saved by faith, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. In other words, we can't work for our salvation. And the believer must walk in faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk by faith, not by sight. Without faith, of course, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six, Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he proves to be the, the one who rewards those who seek him. And whatever we do apart from faith is actually sin, Romans 14, 23. Well, one who doubts is condemned if he eats because of his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, when you study Hebrews 11, you meet men and women of faith who acted upon God's word no matter what price they had to pay. Faith is not some feeling that we work up. It's confidence that God's word is true and conviction that acting on the word will bring blessing. So let's read our main passage today, James 2, 14 through 26. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one who says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he'd offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was working with his was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, "And Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness." And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was Rahab, the prostitute, not justified by works. Also, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So let's look at the subject of dead faith. James is appealing as a brother to other members of the family. 
He writes that there are three kinds of faith, but only one is true, saving faith. Wherever there is the true, we will also find the counterfeit. We know that. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, who is in heaven, will enter. People with dead faith substitute words for deeds. They know the correct Christian vocabulary and can even quote the Bible. But their walk doesn't measure up to their talk. James gives a simple illustration. A poor believer came into the church. The person with dead faith noticed the visitor and saw his needs, but didn't do anything. He only said a few holy sounding words. As believers, we have an obligation to meet the needs of people, no matter who they are, Galatians 6.10. So then, while we have the opportunity, let's do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. To help a person in need is an expression of love, and faith works by love, 1 John 3.17-18. through 18. But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sisters in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let not love with let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. The priest and Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan each had religious training, but neither of them helped the dying man on the side of the road. No doubt if we could talk to them, we would defend their faith, but neither demonstrated that faith with loving works. If a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can his claim be proven, or is it only words? Can such faith, that kind of faith, save him? What kind of faith is James referring to? The kind that is never seen in practical works, Faith in words only cannot save because it isn't the right kind of faith. But what kind is it? Verse 17 tells us it's dead faith. It is faith alone that justifies, that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. It's a good saying. Alone means by itself. Truth saving faith brings life. And life produces good works. The person with dead faith has only an intellectual experience. He knows about salvation, but has never submitted his will to God and only trusted Christ with his whole life. Three times in these verses, James warns us that faith without works is dead or useless. Beware of a mere intellectual faith. No man can come to Christ and remain the same any more than he can come in contact with a 220 volt wire and remain the same. Dead faith is not saving faith. It's a counterfeit faith and lulls a person into a false confidence of eternal life. James says that people tend to fall into two groups, two, two camps. Those who say they have faith and those who say they have deeds. But James says you cannot separate them that way. It's not either or. It has to be both. How can we show our faith without deeds? We have to show up by what we do. If we say we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but we don't commit ourselves to obey him, we're speaking only empty words. You know what? He's not our Lord in that case. Then James goes on to a shocking admission. James wanted to shock his complacent readers, so he uses demons as his illustration. Jesus, the disciples, and Paul cast out demons. Surprisingly enough, demons have faith. Oh, really? Who do they believe? First of all, they believe in the existence of God. They're not atheists or agnostics. Second of all, they believe in the deity of Christ, Mark 3, 
11 through 12. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, you are the son of God. And he strongly warned them not to reveal who he was. The third point is they believe there's a place of punishment. Luke 8, 31. And they were begging him not to command them to go away into the abyss. And number four, they recognize Jesus as the judge and so submit to him. Mark 5, 1 through 13. This is the story of the man by the Gerasenes. They came to the other side of the sea into the region of the Gerasenes. And when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to sub subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and cutting himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do you have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had always already been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the region. Now there was a large herd of pigs feeding nearby on the mountain. And the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs, so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. <laughs> this was, must have been an amazing story to Jews, because they knew they were not supposed to be raising pigs. 2,000 of them. Bye-bye. The Jews' daily affirmation of faith was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. James says that the demons believe that and shudder. Verse 19, people of other religions also may believe in one God. But if they have not committed themselves to follow and obey him, they're like the demons, unsaved. The man of dead faith is touched only in his intellect. The demons were touched also in their emotions. But it's not a saving experience to believe and tremble. A person can be enlightened in his mind and even stirred in his heart and still be lost forever. Even in Christian churches, people can have an easy believism, which actually doesn't save. True saving faith involves something more. In other words, a changed life. How can a person show his faith without works? Being a Christian involves trusting Christ and then living for Christ. You receive the life, then you reveal the life. Faith that's barren or dead is not saving faith. Then what kind of faith can save the sinner? Dynamic faith is real. It has power and results in a changed life. James describes this true faith in various ways. First, it's based on the word of God. We receive our spiritual birth, rebirth through God's word. James 1.18 says in the exercise of his will, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. We receive the word and, and this saves us, James 1.21. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Romans 10.17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. James used Abraham and Rahab as illustrations of dynamic saving faith since both of them heard and received the message through God's word. 
Faith is only as good as its object. No matter how much faith a person may generate, it's not it's not faith in the right person. If it's not faith in the right person, it won't accomplish anything. We're not saved by faith in our faith, but by faith in Christ as revealed in God's word, who is the word incarnate. Secondly, dynamic faith is not only based on God's word, it involves a whole man. Dead faith touches only the intellect. Demonic faith involves the mind and emotions. Dynamic faith also involves the will. It requires the whole person. The mind understands the truth, the heart desires the truth, and the will acts on the truth. Hebrews 11 tells the story of people who heard God speak and obeyed. Thirdly, dynamic faith leads to action. It leads to obedience on the part of the will. This obedience continues through the whole life. It leads to works. We are not saved by our works. Our works prove that we're already saved. James illustrated his point with the lives of two people, Abraham and Abraham. You couldn't find two more different people. Abraham was a Jew in the line of Shem. In fact, he was the father of the Jews. Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man, while Rahab was a prostitute. Abraham was the friend of God while Rahab was one of the enemies of God and his people. What did they have in common? Each of them had saving faith in God. Abraham was called by God who made him a promise. Abraham believed God in his promise, Genesis 15, 5 through 6. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. The Lord counted it to him for righteousness. As a sinner, Abraham's spiritual bank book was empty. But he trusted God, and God put righteousness on Abraham's account. Just as he does when we give our hearts to Christ. It's a gift. Abraham was justified by faith. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous on the basis of Christ's finished work on the cross. How can you tell that someone is justified? The justified person has a changed life and obeys God's will. This is a key point these days, folks. James uses the offspring of Isaac. Abraham wasn't saved by obeying God's command to sacrifice his son, his obedience proved that he was already saved. Abraham wasn't saved by faith plus works, but by a faith that works. By faith, Abraham was justified before God. By works, he demonstrated and proved his justification. Abraham was <clears throat> considered righteous, because he lived out his faith in God. His complete faith in a trustworthy God led him to do what the Lord told him to do, though seemingly insane and even wicked. It was the heathen gods who wanted the sacrifices of their children. How could God be understood as loving and merciful when he required such a sacrifice from Abraham? Faith transcends human reason. It holds on to a loving God in the face of obvious contradictions. Abraham could kill his only precious son, the hope of his promised future on whom God's covenant rested. He could do that because he believed that Isaac belonged first to God. And if God could bring Isaac from uh, Sarah's dead womb, he could also bring him up off the altar alive. Hebrews 11, 17 through uh, 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. 
the one who had received the promises was offered up uh, his own, uh, offered up his only son. It was he to whom it was said, through Isaac, your descendants will shall be named. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him as a type. If Abraham had not obeyed God, it would have shown that his so-called faith was, was dead or useless. Dynamic faith obeys God and proves itself in daily life and works. Abraham was considered righteous for what he did, not just what he believed. His faith and his actions were working together. Faith and actions can't, can't be separated because faith without de deeds is no faith at all. Abraham's faith was made complete by what he did. Faith begins in the understanding, but in order to be complete, it must be worked out in deeds of the hands, feet, and heart. It was Abraham. It was when Abraham climbed Mount Moriah with Isaac and a knife in obedience to God that the scripture was fulfilled in Genesis 15, 6. True faith results in righteousness. But faith is not true without commitment to obey. How can we be considered righteous when we refuse God's will in our lives? Only a righteous person can be called God's friend. Those who love God enough to commit themselves totally to him and do his will, no matter what the cost, are the ones who are God's friends. Next, James goes from the great patriarch of the Jews to the Gentile prostitute, Rahab. What a shock it must have been to the Jewish mind when James linked them together <laughs> by writing in the same way, as Abraham was justified and considered righteous, so was Rahab. Hebrews 11.31, by faith, the prostitute Rahab did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Rahab believed that the Hebrews worshipped the true God and that her city was condemned. She responded with her mind, her emotions, and her will. In believing, she chose to align herself with them. Rahab risked her own life to protect the Jewish spies. She also shared the news of deliverance with her family. In doing this, she declared that she was leaving her city and heritage to become one of them. She later married an Israelite and became the ancestress of David and Christ. Matthew 1 5. Rahab exercised dynamic faith with only a little information. Today, we have a full revelation of God through his word and his son. Abraham's faith, uh, Rahab's faith, is an indictment against the unbelief of today's sinners. So it's important that each to that each person who calls himself a Christian examines his own heart and life to make sure that he possesses true saving or dynamic faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Here are some questions we can ask ourselves. Number one, was there a time when I honestly realized that I was a sinner and admitted this to myself and to God? Number two, was there a time when my heart stirred me to flee from the coming judgment of God? Have I ever been seriously brokenhearted over my sins? Number three, do I understand the gospel, that Christ died for my sins and rose again? Have I realized and confessed that I cannot save myself? Number four, did I seriously present, repent of my sins and turn from them? Do I secretly love sin and want to enjoy it or hate sin and fear God? Number five, have I trusted Christ and Christ alone for my salvation? Do I enjoy a living relationship with him through the word and in the spirit? Number six, has there been a change in my life? Do I seek to grow in the things of the Lord 
Can others tell that I've been with Jesus? Number seven, do I have a desire to share Christ with others? Or am I ashamed of him? Number eight, do I enjoy the fellowship of God's people? Is worship of God a delight to me? And finally, number nine, am I ready for the Lord's return? Or will I be ashamed when he comes? Thank you.